Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Well, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can review the characteristics of a husband with sadistic traits. So I've done videos on both narcissistic and psychopathic husbands and wives. Also did a video on a wife with sadistic traits. So this one is a husband with sadistic traits. So I'll answer this question by looking at the 10 signs of a husband with sadistic traits. Now I covered the construct of sadism in the video I did about the wife with sadistic traits. So I'll just review sadism briefly here and I'll put a link in the description for this video to that other video. In this video I'm going to emphasize providing specific examples along with each sign. This video is focused on a husband and wife relationship right in theory one that's relatively stable not a new relationship or relationship that's falling apart one where there's an expectation that the couple will stay together many if not all of these signs could also apply to anybody in a long-term relationship not necessarily a couple that's married now if someone is sadistic they have a tendency to engage in demeaning cruel antagonistic behavior with the purpose of experiencing pleasure satisfaction excitement or to assert dominance we see three types of behaviors related to sadism, verbal, physical, and vicarious. Verbal is when somebody gains pleasure through embarrassing or humiliating others. Physical, of course, is simply physically hurting others. And vicarious is when somebody gains pleasure through fantasizing or watching violence. Now getting to the 10 signs of a husband with sadistic traits. Having one or more of these signs doesn't necessarily mean somebody is sadistic. Rather, these signs are simply associated with the construct of sadism. The examples I'm using in these signs are from my clinical experience, direct and indirect. Examples of indirect would be like supervising and consulting, as well as from trainings and from the research literature. So sign number one of a husband with sadistic traits, and from this point on I'll just refer to this husband as husband and not say the whole thing each time. Sign number one is to be domineering and threatening. The husband is always getting his way. He wants the wife to know he's in charge and he responds strongly to any challenges. So we see overlap there with narcissism and I'll get to that in a few moments. So this husband makes forceful direct statements. He uses a lot of eye contact in an effort to be intimidating and he really dares the wife to challenge him. Often this husband is willing to follow through with his threats. So there is a violence risk here, particularly if he's challenged in public although he may wait later on to exact his revenge, but not always. Sign number two, the husband is angry when the wife talks to others. Now, not just talking in general, but specific situations. So say the couple are talking to neighbors, and the wife is telling a story about her husband, perhaps a story that's not flattering to him, maybe a little embarrassing. He might give the wife an angry look, and later he might accuse the wife of talking about their business to other people, and trying to embarrass him. He might also accuse her of trying to gain sympathy, even if it's just an innocuous conversation, like she was reaching out and trying to get support from the neighbors. We see a theme here of the husband trying to block any avenues for the wife to get support. Again, whether she's trying to get that support or not, he's very vigilant about that topic. Sign number three, the wife is never good enough for the husband. He likes to keep her insecurity level high. He does this to cause pain, but also to establish and maintain dominance. So a few examples here. The husband is highly critical of the wife's appearance. So an example I've seen a lot is the husband makes criticisms about the wife gaining weight. Now, of course, this is an unheard of behavior. Some husbands point out weight gain out of genuine concern or because they find the extra weight unattractive. Now, this isn't necessarily polite, but it's not sadistic at that level. It's sadistic when it's not done to cause a change in appearance. It's not done for like a pro-social reason, but rather to make the wife feel insecure, to make her believe that her husband is the only one that would tolerate her appearance. So again, this is really just to maintain that dominance. He doesn't necessarily want the wife to improve her appearance, lose the weight, whatever it is. He wants to make sure that she understands that he's better than her, that she's lucky to have him. That's actually kind of a central mission or goal of 
the husband with sadistic traits. Another example is the constant threat of infidelity. And again, going along with this theme, I can do better, I have options, you don't have options, you'll never find someone as good as me. And the husband may fall through with an affair to prove his point. And he usually won't make too much of an effort to hide the affair. Because again, the wife finding out is important to maintaining her level of insecurity, her high level of insecurity. Sign number four is no reprieve. So this is more about the pattern of behavior as opposed to any specific behavior. This is when the husband acts in a sadistic way continually. He wants to keep the wife on the defensive, wear her down. It's a war of attrition. He wants the wife to stay afraid and tired. Two really key points there for the husband with sadistic traits. In a marriage like this, there are no good times or maybe few good times. Again, the pressure is fairly constant. These sadistic acts often take the form of daily habits. For example, coming home from work and expecting the wife to be there, whether she works outside the home or not. The wife may rush to get home from her job or other activities because she's anxious about it. She's anxious about the sadistic tactics that will occur if she's not there on time. So again, she may rush and I've seen this to the point where the wife accumulates moving violations, right? She's speeding on the way home and being somewhat reckless, and she gets tickets. We also see with this one, the no reprieve, the husband is unmoved by pleas for compassion. So he will not relent even when the wife points it out and asks for a break from the behavior. He may even call those pleas manipulative toward him. So the wife is trying to manipulate him by getting a break from his bad behavior. That's the poor logic the husband tries to promote. Sign number five is personality. We see that sadism tends to co-occur with other personality traits, specifically psychopathy, like high factor one psychopathy, lack of empathy, being callous, unemotional. We see narcissism, like grandiose narcissism, being self-centered, manipulative, having a sense of entitlement, and Machiavellianism, so being cynical, and opportunistic. These three traits together, along with subclinical sadism, are called the dark tetrad. Now, we also see the dark triad talked about in the research literature. That's just psychopathy, narcissism, and Machiavellianism. So there's really two theories there, dark tetrad, the four traits, and dark triad, the three traits. In both theories, sadism is really there, though, because in the dark triad, sadism is a part of psychopathy and narcissism. In the dark tetrad, sadism is separated out into its own construct. Sign number six is limiting access to resources. This is not only sadistic, but it really goes in line here with this whole dominance and control piece. So I've seen many examples of this, just a few, complaining about money. For example, the husband might say that he takes care of the money. This is his area. He keeps his paycheck and he keeps the wife's paycheck and he allows her to have some funds. That's how he thinks about the money situation. He's really in control and he's being generous for allowing her access to money. So this is really, again, control and humiliation oriented. I've also seen it used in the area of education. And this is one of the more, I think, significant red flags around sadistic behavior. So there may be a situation where the wife wants to go to college or return to college. And the husband might say, why do you need to do that? What are you going to do with the degree? Do you think you can get some sort of fancy job just because you have a degree? And we see that if the wife does go to college, say, the husband becomes increasingly irritated with every credit that she earns, with every completed course, as she gets closer and closer to completing a degree. And he makes an effort to sabotage her education, cutting off the money, demanding attention during her study time. Education provides power and choices and those are two things the husband does not want the wife to have. Sign number seven is blaming the wife for everything that goes wrong. So if the husband loses his job, he says to the wife, you should have been more supportive. If he forgets to pay a bill, you should have reminded me to pay that bill. He enjoys seeing the wife worry. He wants her to feel pain. So we see this phrase, share the joy. The husband with sadistic traits is really about share the pain. So with the sign, the husband essentially takes no responsibility for any of his bad acts. So there's a few components to it, not only the sadistic component, but also a narcissistic component there. Sign number eight is 
the husband takes pranks too far. And I've seen this many times. When the pranks go too far and the wife gets upset, he blames the wife for being too sensitive. We also see a really poor selection of pranks, just bad judgment. And some of the pranks I've seen aren't really even pranks at all. They're pranks in the mind of the husband, but they wouldn't be considered pranks by most people's standards. So some of the pranks I've seen that, again, may not even be pranks, but are certainly somewhat lined up with sadistic behavior. Hiding the car keys from a wife, so the wife might be late for work a few times, and the husband wants to prove a point, so he hides her keys to deliberately make her late. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I saw a situation where the wife actually lost her job because she couldn't find the keys that the husband hid. So not funny, not smart, not even really a prank. Just doing something harmful. I've seen the situation where the husband tries to wake the wife up with a loud noise. This isn't funny or safe. Somebody could fall or hit their head or something if they wake up suddenly. And I've seen situations where the husband tries to scare the wife with an object that looks like something that she's afraid of, like a fake spider, for example. Now, some researchers believe that all pranks are really associated to some degree or another with sadism. I suppose it really depends on the prank, right? Like, I've seen pranks that are meant to be confusing in general, like, so something's put out in public, that people walk by and they're confused by what's going on. That really doesn't seem sadistic. I mean, it's a little unusual, but I wouldn't say sadistic. The ones I would be more likely to consider sadistic would be those that are deliberately designed to cause a specific fear, right? So the husband wants to cause his wife to be afraid. That really just seems destructive. I don't really see the humorous component in that. And that's where I think a lot of these researchers kind of line up with thinking about pranks as sadistic. Sign number nine is parental alienation. And we often think about this term in the context of a custody dispute. So two people are separated, they're getting divorced, say, and the husband will try to turn the children against the wife, or the wife will try to turn the children against the husband. Usually when we think of the term parental alienation, we see accusations of the wife trying to turn the kids against the husband. But here, of course, I'm talking about the husband's behavior, and I'm talking about a situation that wouldn't involve separation or divorce. So the husband can do this in the absence of a ongoing separation, especially if the children are supportive of the wife. So this can just be a tactic to not only be sadistic, but to block any type of support or aid that the children might be providing. So if the children are siding with the wife on different issues, the father might try to turn those children against the wife, to pull those children over to his team, so to speak, and kind of line up against the wife. Now, certainly this is more common in separation situations, but I've seen this in all types of relationships where one of the individuals has sadistic traits. So it's kind of a common tactic that we can see across many phases of marital relationships. So now moving to sign number 10. This one is when the husband is dominant in terms of physical intimacy. So he's demanding when it comes to sex, not only the frequency, but the type. So the husband is dominant, forceful, and gets pleasure through pain or humiliation. So in a sense, he's not indifferent to how the wife feels. He deliberately wants the wife to suffer. This is one of the more disturbing elements of the husband with sadistic traits. And I've seen this many times, many examples of this through my clinical experience and those other areas I talked about, like trainings and what we see in the research literature. Now, I know the argument that could be made here is that, well, what if the two people are consenting? Well, if somebody behaves dominant in a consensual situation like that, the individual could still be sadistic. So in this example, the husband could still be sadistic. Just because it's consensual doesn't mean that there's no sadism anywhere in the situation. Obviously, there are some situations where people kind of play roles in terms of physical intimacy, and it can be healthy and a kind of a normal part of their relationship, but sometimes it can be unhealthy, and it can be difficult sometimes to differentiate these behaviors, just like the behaviors around pranks, right? A lot of couples play pranks on one another. A lot of husbands and wives might do this with the pranks, but you really have to look at the motivation behind it and also the end result and how the person responds, right? How the potential victim responds to that behavior. Do they think it's funny? Do they think it's supportive? Are they also returning that behavior, like with the pranks? Are they reciprocating and it's kind of lighthearted? 
or is it really more about fear, pain, and suffering? Sadism in a marriage can be tricky from a counseling perspective. The goal of sadism, of course, as I mentioned, to cause pain and suffering, embarrassment and humiliation, but also to maintain control. So in a marriage, in a situation like where the husband has sadistic traits, the wife can feel tired, weak, unable to fight, and this is how the husband maintains control and continues with his sadistic acts. So it can be tough as a counselor working with the situation because obviously there are forces pushing and pulling the wife. She wants to stay in the relationship, potentially, but there's also reasons why she wants to leave. She also has that motivation. So it can become about ambivalence, right? Strong feelings in both directions. And when you have a situation where the wife can't really make her own decision because the husband is causing harm, it just makes it even more difficult to kind of maintain the boundaries and to help the wife in that context. One of the things I hear a lot from counselors, particularly counselors in training, is they really can't believe that a lot of couples stay together, right, because of the amount of bad acts that occur within the marriage. They're stunned that anybody would stay in relationships like that. But if you look at the whole picture, if you look at a history of sadism and dominance and control, it makes sense. It makes sense that somebody would stay because they're tired of fighting. And in some sense, they become accustomed to the circumstances. Of course, this is tragic, but simply judging won't help. Simply saying, oh, you need to leave that relationship won't help. It's up to the wife to make that decision, right? We hope that that decision can be made with clarity, but ultimately, it's the wife's decision to make. And sometimes individuals stay in relationships deliberately, knowing what's going on, knowing that they're the victim of sadistic behavior. So from a counseling point of view, sometimes counselors look at the situation and they just feel frustrated because they're unable to make a change that they feel would be positive. But respecting the autonomy of the client is one of the goals of counseling, right? It's one of the ethical standards that we maintain. So we have to go with the client's choice, assuming that choice doesn't hurt other people or cause some sort of significant damage, right? There are limitations, of course, to autonomy. But in general, somebody can stay in a marriage even if they are on the receiving end of sadistic behavior. Another difficult scenario I see in terms of like counselors and training coming to me with different problems and concerns is when their client is the husband with sadistic traits, right? They can't warn the wife. They know the client is trying to manipulate the wife. They know the client is causing harm to the wife. But again, unless it's something serious, right, where there'd be like a duty to warn that would take effect, the counselor is unable to directly intervene. Now, of course, they can work with the husband to talk about better ways to manage the relationship that don't involve sadistic acts and things like that. But there's no real direct intervention except at an extreme level. And this becomes frustrating to counselors as well. So there's a lot of clinical challenges we see when we observe sadism in marital relationships. I know whenever I talk about topics like sadism and marriage, there'll be a lot of opinions. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate a really interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found this description of the husband with sadistic traits to be interesting. Thanks for watching.